I'm so grateful to be here. And it's actually quite, <laughs> I, you know, it's unlikely that I'm here. Because I grew up in a very quiet house, extraordinarily quiet, and I wasn't quite convinced that I existed. My way of dealing with the situation was to just disappear, to be quiet, not to have a voice. And this is the pre-internet era. So then the internet arrives. And luckily enough, in my young adulthood, and I then had a voice and some courage, actually. And I began moving from job to job. Some of you have traced me through these perambulations. And life became increasingly interesting. And the internet has given me much of the best stuff of my life, no doubt about it. And I'm worried that in talking about internet access, and I'm here I'm talking about the pipes, the dirt, the wires, the 95% of the network that is needed before you have your wireless device attached to it. When we talk about internet access, we do it in such impoverished terms, such inhuman terms. We miss most of the best stuff when we talk about internet access. Because we have this idea that what you can't measure has no value. And the power of human relationships, anytime, anywhere, when needed, as needed, the power of sharing, of collaboration, when needed, as needed, can't be measured. And so the policymakers in Washington and often around the world look at this in sheerly economic terms to our peril around the world. Now, this wasn't always the case in America. In 1932, the leading presidential issue in the campaign that year was electrification, the electrification of America. And FDR, look how cheerful he is. He comes to give a speech during the campaign about electrification policy, and he talks about the human importance of electrification. That without it, we'll end up with people who aren't able to take the best advantage of their own faculties, to determine their own lives, to open their minds after sundown, to remove from their shoulders the drudgery of work without electrification. Now, he was attacked roundly for going up against the electricity trusts, because at that point, electric distribution in America was controlled by a very few companies, maybe a dozen, maybe a handful. And they were unregulated, and they were taking advantage of the ability to raise prices without constraint, right? And to provide terrible customer service. So FDR took these guys on, and he was attacked as a Bolshevik, a socialist, a radical, and above all, as a dangerous man for doing this, right? Because that wasn't the economic point of view that he was expressing, this human importance of electricity. Now, the other guy, Hoover, not smiling, he's saying, play it safe. From his perspective, it's just too expensive to do anything about electricity in America. Makes no sense, right? FDR is able, as a leader, to talk about and convey the human importance of this physical infrastructure, to put that idea across. So you know where I'm going with this. So today, uh, in the last four years, five years, Comcast, uh, Time Warner Cable, AT&T, and Verizon, fine, great American companies, made $1.4 trillion in the last five years, only 15% of which they invested in their networks. I'll get to that part of the story later. And um, what's going on in America is that they are engaging in what people call bounded competition, which means essentially no, no real competition. They've consolidated. We're seeing that daily, new announcements of mergers all the time. And this is an industry that depends on scale and scope, and they have all of those advantages. So they've divided markets. You take wires, we'll take wireless, mutually acceptable price points, you know, uh, never engaging in head-to-head -head price wars. Why would they do that? That would be destructive to the entire status quo. And I love this cartoon. I think this is a really hilarious. That Time Warner is now blanked out because they're merging with Comcast. But there's, there's Verizon and AT&T. And this is going to have, is having an effect on human ingenuity, on our ability to thrive 
as Americans because we want to be able to communicate, right? And here's our favorite video from the last uh, week. Now, John Oliver here is talking about uh, high-speed internet access in a way that is grabbing people's attention. And millions of people have watched this video because this is a human question. They need to be able to communicate or they won't have a thriving life. He's raising net neutrality as a big issue, but we've got a host of issues. Net neutrality is just the tip of the iceberg because we're gonna see lots of 1-800 services not covered by the net neutrality rules, new charges for devices. A lot of Time Warner Cable's current uh, profit is coming from renting cable modems. Well, that's just the beginning. Uh, tiered pricing, usage-based billing in a world in which you face no competition, charging more for different buckets of bits is a great model for reaping additional rewards. Uh, new charges for connections from other networks. And a titanic battle of uh, market power is moving ahead in this country. Um, and we're getting many more Americans involved, which is terrific. But we need to move the conversation into the greatest abuse of all, which is that the country is not making a migration to fiber, to fiber optic. And we're going to need it. I know we're gonna need it because we're being squeezed in all directions. Um, we're going to go through a thousand X demand for wireless data. We're going to go through needing a lot of, uh, you know, up uh, backhaul and upstream communications to be those human beings, to be present to each other, which is all that humans want. All of you, each one of you are using gigabit connections right now. I know that to a certainty and that's because you cannot buy a device these days that doesn't have a 10 gigabit port in it. So the devices are doing very well at manipulating bits, but the, having those bits leaving your, leave your house, they have to go through a very narrow wire to get there <laughs> because that's all that's available to us. The, the capacity of the network is now serving as a constraint on the processing power of devices and necessarily human ingenuity as well, and the ability to be present to each other, which is the goal of a fiber network. The pixels actually fall away. We know that we can be present in a doctor's office, present in the classroom, and that's just the beginning with fiber. You don't know what it's like until you've experienced it. You just take advantage of the idea that there could be a screen in every house, in every room in every house, antennae in every room, enormous amounts of demand for backhaul from all of that. This is a very primitive chart showing what's gonna be possible with fiber. We've got a much greater journey to travel, but we're stuck with the status quo, because right now the status quo is great for these companies and terrible for the rest of us. Being present to each other, fully communicating in each other's lives, is the output of a genuine fiber network throughout the country and around the world, but we have no chance of making that upgrade given the current situation. Now, federal policy is pretty much at a standstill these days, as far as I can tell. We seem to be hoping for some action from the FCC. I'm not sure that much is gonna happen, to tell you the truth. And mayors are sick of waiting and settling in America for better connections for their citizens. So more and more of them are thinking about installing dark fiber networks, basic passive infrastructure, like a street grid, available for all competitive uses, and available for this presence application for human lives. Stocab in Stockholm is the city-owned entity that laid that dark fiber 20 years ago. It's just passive infrastructure. It's not lit, which means that the glass tubes have no electronics go through them. That means lots of competition, lots of new uses, lots of new devices. And here's my quote from a 20-something guy that I interviewed in Sweden. He just goes into his apartment, he opens up the laptop, and he's got many choices of providers. It's all very cheap. Stockholm is growing faster than any other European city. It's a home for tech startups. They're very optimistic in Stockholm. It's dark in December. Don't go in December, but it's an optimistic place. And it's just a street grid. It's just infrastructure, right? passive, neutral, available to everyone, not competing directly in the private market, but making the private market possible and making presence, this human communication, possible for everyone in Stockholm. Now, New York City could do this. There is an 1891 contract never amended between New York City and something called Empire City Subways, an entity that controls the conduit underneath the streets of Manhattan and the Bronx. New York City has a direct relationship with ECS, 
by which it could cause ECS to lay dark fiber, open up the co dark conduit, make sure that uh, landlords have connections in their houses. But here's the problem. ECS is now a subsidiary of Verizon. So Verizon answers the phone when the city calls. That doesn't diminish the city's actual regulatory power, but it does make the city quite sensitive about what it's going to do. This is going to take a lot of leadership and gumption on Mayor de Blasio's part, or whoever the next mayor is, to get this done. Also, the city receives $150 million in video franchise fees from Verizon and Time Warner Cable. And cutting away from that revenue in the short term feels hard. But in the long term, we need to work harder. We need to make sure that the people who, in New York City who can't afford a wire have one. And there are more than 2 million who don't at the moment. We need to make sure that the businesses that might leave Manhattan because they don't have adequate connectivity here, stay. And New York City should be leading Seattle, San Francisco, Boston, all the other cities in America that are considering dark fiber networks, but are sort of looking at each other to see who goes first, get into the tunnels, work it out, move towards fiber, real human connection made possible by leadership, like that leadership shown by FDR. So don't elect a candidate unless he does something or she does something about fiber. And remember that we have a very bright, very bright dark fiber future ahead of us. We just have to move purposefully towards that goal. Thanks very much.